Hello Physiology. We're going to start our online lecture with section 9.2 in our physiology text, which is page two begins on page 262. This will be a little bit of an overlap with what we had covered in lecture, but it's the first complete, I wanted to start with a complete uh, section. So we of course are already covered 9.1, um, so we'll begin here with some of the material from 9.2. So in 9.2, the first thing that we see uh, is an overview of the anatomy of the neuromuscular uh, junction and the, the so-called motor unit, as we'll discuss here. Um, so one thing that we notice and, and um, want to review ourselves on is that skeletal muscles, and here we're exclusively talking about skeletal muscles, only contract as a result of stimulation via the neuromuscular uh, junction. And so skeletal muscles, of course, are innervated by motor neurons. Motor neurons are some of the largest neurons in the body. And motor neurons are also myelinated. So remember that both of those factors uh, speeds up the conduction of the action potentials through those neurons. Uh, both the diameter and myelination uh, have a positive impact on the speed by which action potentials travel uh, through neurons. We look at the motor unit uh, in the picture at the bottom of our screen here, which is figure 9.7 on page 263 of your text. And so a motor unit is the term that's, that is used to describe the motor neuron plus all the muscle fibers that that particular motor neuron connects to or innervates. And so if we look at uh, A, uh, part A of figure 9.7, we see a single uh, motor unit. Uh, and a single motor unit consists of several, uh, of a single, um, obviously, motor neuron and several muscle fibers. Uh, we could also refer to them as muscle cells that it, can, that it connects to. The size of motor units varies dramatically in different parts of the body. There are probably no motor units that are as small as five, which is what's depicted in A there. But some apparently are as small as 10. It's much more common to have much larger motor units, and we would find those in other areas, uh, in, in areas of the body where we have very large muscles that uh, cannot be controlled extremely precisely. Your quadriceps would be a good example of that. And the muscles uh, located, of course, there on, on the front of your leg, just above your knee. And so the motor units in your quadriceps are often over a thousand, uh, contain over a, a thousand muscle fibers. In other words, you have one motor neuron connecting to a thousand muscle fibers. If we look at part B of figure 9.7 over there in the lower right hand side of the screen, what we notice is that the motor units are mixed together within a uh, muscle comprising the entire muscle. And so uh, we, of course, our book has color-coded it there, and so we can see that we have uh, a purple cell connecting to purple nerve cell connecting to purple muscle fibers, an orange nerve cell connecting to orange muscle fibers, and that gives us a good idea of how these things are arranged in the body. And so each muscle uh, would be composed of these fibers that are part of individual motor units, but they're all mixed together within the actual muscle. Now as we move on, what we want to look at next is the actual anatomy of the neuromuscular junction. And there's not a whole lot of new material uh, to, to look at here because what we see is that this is going to be very similar to the neuron-neuron junctions that we observed in, in previous uh, chapters. The anatomy is, is extremely similar. And so what we have on the screen here is figure 9.8 on page 263 of our text. And on the left-hand side, we have an electron micrograph. Um, we can, of course, see the motor axon um, connecting to several different uh, muscle fibers. And so here we see the axon terminal, and we notice that the axon terminal is slightly embedded in the muscle fiber. And then if we go over to part B, we see a nice little drawing uh, of this, and we can see that the axon terminal is slightly embedded in the muscle fiber. We notice uh, some structures that we're familiar with from previous chapters. We see our vesicles uh, docked there at the presynaptic membrane containing acetylcholine. We see the sarcolemma uh, 
of the muscle cell. Uh, we want to remind ourselves that the muscle, uh, the plasma membrane, excuse me, of the muscle fiber is known as the sarcolemma. In the region of the sarcolemma that's found directly underneath the axon terminal, which is what I'm outlining here with the pointer, is referred to as the motor end plate, the motor end plate. The motor end plate is the portion of the sarcolemma that contains the uh, a high concentration of these um, uh, nicotinic uh, receptors, these, these receptors for acetylcholine, which is going to be released, of course, from these synaptic uh, vesicles. So with that in mind, with the anatomy in mind, we move on to the physiology of what happens at the neuromuscular junction. And so this, is, again, is um, actually something we've, we talked about um, in nearly identical fashion back when we talked about the junctions between to the nerve, the uh, junction that's found between two nerve cells. So what we notice is that, <clears throat> just like in those previous examples, as we look at figure 9-9 here on page 264 of our text, an action potential reaches the axon terminal, um, and it opens these voltage-gated calcium gates that we see depicted here. Calcium uh, rushes in to the axon terminal, Calcium interacts with those proteins that we discussed previously that causes fusion of these vesicles with the presynaptic membrane. Uh, once that fusion occurs, acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine binds to nicotinic receptors found in the postsynaptic side of the membrane. These nicotinic receptors open. Uh, sodium uh, rushes in, and sodium causes depolarization in the muscle cell um, and this is enough to initiate an action potential and that action potential spreads out from this particular junction uh, to the rest of the muscle fiber. Typically what we see is this, that these junctions between the motor neuron and the muscle fiber are found in the middle of the muscle cell and once this depolarization occurs and an, and an action potential is initiated then the action potential spreads out towards either end of that uh, particular muscle fiber. The term that we used to describe the depolarization uh, that occurs in the muscle fiber is an in-plate potential, EPP, an in-plate uh, potential, which is a little bit different than the EPSPs, the excitatory postsynaptic potentials that we discussed that occur when one nerve connects to another uh, nerve. All right, so in this particular slide, um, what we notice is a couple things that we want to keep in mind. Uh, and so one is this, that the um, amount of depolarization, the degree of depolarization that occurs when an action potential reaches the end of a motor neuron and acetylcholine is released and binds to the nicotinic receptors on the, the muscle fiber, that depolarization is greater than what we observed in the nerve-nerve interactions previously. In other words, an EPP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential, which is what we're describing here, is greater than an EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. The term EPSP is a term that we reserved, or we do reserve, for the depolarization that occurs on uh, a postsynaptic uh, nerve. So when one nerve cell interacts with another nerve cell, it creates an EPSP. The EPSPs, as you realize, are, are not always sufficient to generate an action potential, but you're familiar with summation and the fact that it typically takes a number of EPSPs to create an action potential in the postsynaptic nerve cell. In the case of muscle fibers and EPPs, th this is quite a bit different. Typically, one EPP generates an action potential. And the reason for this is multifold. Uh, one is that a greater amount of neurotransmitter is released, the neurotransmitter is released over a greater uh, surface area, and there's a higher density of nicotinic receptors that are found uh, in the motor end plate uh, on the uh, sarcolemma. And so um, we wanna keep in mind that typically one EPP is enough to generate a single action potential. Now another thing to, uh, to make note of is that all neuromuscular junctions are excitatory. This is different than what we observed in nerve-nerve interactions. Of course, you realize in that case, 
you can have inhibition as well as excitation, but in the case of neuromuscular junctions, everything is fairly simple. We only have nicotinic receptors, and we uh, th those interactions, of course, have to be excitatory because all a nicotinic receptor could do is excite. Now, we talked about the end plate uh, location in the muscle fiber, so let's jump down to bullet point number three. Acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme, as you realize, that uh, breaks down acetylcholine. It's found in the uh, synaptic cleft between, in this case, the nerve and the muscle. And it uh, breaks down acetylcholine into, into acetate and choline, which is transported back into the presynaptic membrane. And that in-plate potential is going to remain depolarized until acetylcholine is removed. So it's worth noting that in order for your muscles to function correctly, then acetylcholine must be released into the cleft and then very rapidly, uh, within a matter of milliseconds, removed by acetylcholinesterase. If anything interferes with the neuromuscular junction, then that, of course, is bad news for the organism. And so as a result, what we notice is that there are a number of compounds that do interfere with the neuromuscular junction. Uh, as you might expect, um, because of this is a, a sensitive point in an organism's physiology, there are a number of toxins and poisons that have evolved that target this particular aspect of physiology. And sadly, uh, as humans, uh, you know, we also, uh, in some cases, have wanted to um, cause harm to other organisms. And so, as we see here, we've also come up with uh, compounds that target this particular junction between nerves and muscles. And so, on this screen, we have a couple from our text that are found on page 264. These are compounds that interfere with this the neuromuscular sig signal uh, at the neuromuscular junction. So, the first one is curare. And so, curare is an alkaloid. Um, it's all natural uh, and uh, found in a number of plants, interestingly from a couple of different families apparently, that are found in South America. And it is used uh, sometimes on poison arrows, as is being depicted there in that uh, one photograph, because of its uh, very uh, potent toxicity. And curare is an antagonist for nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And so, in other words, it binds to those receptors, in this case with a high affinity, and it is not broken down by uh, acetylcholinesterase. Um, and so it, it also does not cause the nicotinic receptors to open. And so it causes paralysis and eventually death if concentrations are sufficient as a result of paralysis of the diaphragm, which of course is necessary in order to uh, breathe. Patients can be kept alive with respiration. I've talked to you about those early experiments in which they demonstrated this. I believe that was actually with botulinum toxin, but with um, animals and, and um, in a very primitive way with bellows. So uh, next, um, what we notice is this. In the second bullet, bullet point, sadly, we as humans have sometimes wanted to uh, cause harm in very horrific ways. And so accidentally, we discovered um, that we could synthesize organic compounds that act as uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, in other words, they bind to acetylcholinesterase and prevent uh, acetylcholinesterase, of course, from binding to acetylcholine. Um, and so uh, this is the case for the so-called nerve gases um, that we've talked about before in class, uh, most notably here in Kentucky. Uh, interestingly, I read an article about this uh, yesterday, actually, and, and 2% of our country's stores of nerve gas is found uh, in Madison County there at the Blue Gas Army Depot, and they're in the process of destroying it um, as uh, I make this video. So it's, it's you know, it's a, a tragic uh, aspect of human history that those were made in the first place, but they are, or they are um, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and the uh, end result is the following, that acetylcholine Upon exposure, acetylcholine remains in the synaptic cleft, and you would expect that to result in extremely sustained contraction. It doesn't, though. Action potentials are not generated for the entire extent of the time that the nicotinic receptors are open, but rather the nicotinic receptors eventually become desensitized um, to acetylcholine, 
And so it actually results in paralysis and death as a result of the same reason that curare uh, killed uh, organisms, uh, because of paralysis of the diaphragm. Interestingly, in this case, we also see that acetylcholine builds up at muscarinic uh, synapses, such as the junction of the vagus nerve with the SA node of the heart. And so you have drastic slowing of the heart rate as a result of the accumulation of acetylcholine there at that uh, junction in the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, one thing I didn't notice, a uh, note rather, under this bullet point are organophosphate pesticides. And so organophosphate pesticides are pesticides that target uh, acetylcholinesterase. And so these are, are mostly what we refer to as second generation pesticides. Um, and so they are mostly not in use uh, today, although that's not in, uh, completely uh, true. But they're relatively primitive pesticides because they target an aspect of insect physiology and, of course, they also target part of your physiology. And so uh, death, uh, disturbingly, in humans uh, is observed if humans are exposed to a high enough dose of these uh, pesticides. Our, our uh, third generation and more sophisticated pesticides target aspects of insect physiology that we do not share, fortunately, um, and so they pose less danger to humans. Lastly, we have our old favorite botulinum toxin. And so botulinum toxin, as you know, uh, destroys those snare proteins and therefore prevents the release of acetylcholine um, and uh, causes paralysis and, and then death, uh, just like curare uh, did as a result of um, the failure of the diaphragm to contract. Uh, the mechanism is, of course, different, but the end result uh, is the same. Um, and so botulinum toxin is, um, of course, one of the, the, if not the most potent toxin known to man, produced by the uh, clostridial uh, bacteria. And it is also used in, in controlled doses for, of course, Botox, as being shown in that picture, and uh, to uh, alleviate hyperhidrosis or ex excessive, uh, excessive sweating. So interestingly... The fact that the neuromuscular junction physiology is fairly complex and essential for life uh, means that there are several compounds, uh, both in the natural world and things that we have created, that target and interfere with the transmission of the signal across that particular aspect of our, our physiology. We move on now to talk a bit about, and we're still in uh, section 9.2, but we're talking about uh, excitation contraction coupling. In other words, how do we go from the electrical signal, which we've talked about, to the actual contraction of the muscle? And so at this point, we're on page 265 of the text. And what we notice in figure 9-10, 9.10, is um, that so we see a difference in the length of time that the action potential persists versus the tension that's created by the muscular contraction. Um, and in the top of figure 9-10, in the green line here, as I'm pointing out with the cursor, we see that the action potential lasts just a couple milliseconds, and then it's gone. Um, and so you're familiar with all the aspects of the action potential there, and, and um, that's, you know, that, that's the end of that. But then, interestingly, what we notice is that the tension generated by muscle contraction as a result of that action potential doesn't even start until the action potential is completely gone. And then the tension rises and rises and rises, and it's gonna persist for 100 milliseconds or more following that action potential. And so a question, a good question is why? Why does it take so long for this tension to generate, uh, even though the action potential itself is quite rapid? To understand that, we have to have some understanding of the mechanism of muscle contraction. And so to do that, we need to introduce two more proteins. Um, and so these proteins are tropomyosin and troponin. If we look at our, our diagram, and this is diagram, uh, this is figure 9.11 on page 265, what we see is that we have tropomyosin, which is composed of two rope-like proteins. Tropomyosin is uh, arranged into these units that are connected end to end, each unit of tropomyosin covers seven actin monomers. In other words, one, two, three, as I'm counting there with the cursor, three, four, five, six, whoops, seven. So seven from right there to right there. So this is one tropomyosin monomer that covers 
those seven units of actin. And then, of course, although it's not really depicted here in our book, there's a junction and then there's another tropomyosin that's connected to that one that covers the next seven actin monomers. Now, connected to tropomyosin, we have troponin. And so troponin is a globular protein that consists of three subunits, an inhibitory subunit, a tropomyosin binding subunit, and a calcium binding subunit. And so the basic mechanism here is the following. Calcium, well, one thing to note is this, that if we look at this diagram, figure 9.11, this cross bridge, this actin cross bridge that we talked about previously, is ready to bind to, oh, whoops, sorry, this myosin cross bridge, I'm sorry, this myosin cross bridge is ready to bind to actin, and it has already been energized by ATP, and so it's ready to contract. And so nothing happens in the case of skeletal muscle. It's going to be a little bit different in the case of cardiac and smooth muscle. But in the case of skeletal muscle, nothing happens regarding myosin. It's ready to contract. But what does happen is that calcium comes along. It binds to the calcium binding subunit of troponin. It changes the conformation of troponin, which therefore moves tropomyosin out of the way. Once tropomyosin, the long rope-like blue protein here, is moved out of the way, Myosin can bind to actin, and once myosin binds to actin, then myosin goes, a, goes ahead and completes what's referred to as its power stroke, undergoing a contraction and moving the actin filament ever so slightly. And this, and only this, is the process that generates muscle contraction. Now, what we're going to do on this particular slide is back up just one step and look at how calcium levels in the muscle are elevated. As we learned in the previous slide, we understand that muscle contraction occurs as a result of elevated uh, calcium. So now we ask the question, well, how does calcium in the muscle cell become elevated? Now, in order for that to happen, there has to be some connection, some link between the action potential and the release of calcium. And this is that link. So an action potential, I'm looking now, we are on page 266, and we are on figure 9-12, 9.12, which is uh, the figure that we, we see right here in the lower right-hand corner of our screen. The action potential is cruising along the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the muscle cell, and it dives down here into the T-tubules of the muscle cell. Once it gets down deep into the T-tubules, it comes across uh, these things referred to as junctional feet. The junctional feet consist of two separate proteins. One protein is embedded in the sarcolemma. One protein is embedded in the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. So let's go ahead and point out some anatomy here. This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what I'm pointing to right here and right here are the lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, and the lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum contain high concentrations of calcium and so what's going to happen is the following embedded in the sarcolemma within the, the t-tubule there is a dihydropyridine receptor and so this DHP receptor simply acts as a voltage uh, meter and so when the action potential reaches it, it causes a change in this DHP receptor, um, which is a, a protein, obviously. And that protein, uh, DHP receptor, interacts with the, a ryanidine receptor. The ryanidine receptor is a protein, the entire thing is shown in purple here, that's embedded in the surface of the, um, the, the surface of, of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as you can see in this particular diagram. And, and it has two different uh, parts, um, and one part consists of an actual channel embedded in, in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that opens in response to the change in conformation introduced in the, in the ranidine receptor, which is caused by the change in conformation of the DHP receptor, which was caused in turn, of course, by the arrival of the action potential. So when this takes place, in other words, when the action potential arrives, causes a change in the DHP receptor, a change in the ranidine receptor, which opens the calcium channel, which is part of the ranidine receptor, which means that calcium flows out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium levels in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell go up dramatically. 
And this calcium then saturates the troponin binding sites. Um, but what we notice is that the action potential is then gone. And so the riandine receptor channel closes almost immediately and calcium begins to be removed almost immediately. And it's pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by calcium ATPases that act via active transport, of course, reaccumulate that calcium back in these lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the end result is that the myosin cross bridges attach to actin undergo a power stroke, as we mentioned previously, and each little power stroke of the myosin head, shown down here, moves the actin filaments ever so slightly. It takes a number of power strokes, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60, to for a muscle to undergo complete contraction. And so when you visualize this occurring, what you should be imagining is these little myosin uh, heads undergoing power stroke after power stroke and reattaching, releasing and then reattaching to the actin uh, in order to uh, for a muscle to uh, completely contract. This, of course, is referred to as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. We are now looking at uh, figure 914 on page 267 of your text, and it looks like this is figure 913 uh, here down at the bottom. But overall, the sliding filament uh, mechanism of contraction simply states this, that here in A, we have a relaxed muscle. Here in B, we have a contracted muscle. And so what has happened is these little myosin heads have undergone a number of power strokes, grabbing onto the actin filament a number of times and shortening the overall distance of the sarcomere. What we'll see on this next slide uh, is this, are the steps that occur in a cross bridge cycle that, of course, allows the myosin to attach to actin and undergo a power stroke and, and therefore allows the overall sarcomere to shorten. What I'm going to do is uh, jump to this zoomed in slide for just a moment so we can talk uh, more comfortably, we can see it better, um, about each step that occurs in this cycle. We'll begin with one in this diagram, which is, of course, uh, figure 915 on page 268 of your text. And what we notice is this, that as, I, as we said previously, the myosin head is ready to go. And uh, what you'll see here is that ADP and a phosphate are bound to the myosin head, and this tells us that um, ADP, ATP rather, has already bound to myosin, and the myosin head is in the, the so-called cocked position. It's like a loaded mousetrap, or a mousetrap with a spring that's been pulled back. It's ready to spring forward, but it won't spring forward until the myosin head makes contact with actin. And so we go down here to number two, and what you'll notice in your, your book is that in this particular case, uh, these molecules that are connected by a dot, that indicates that they're bound together. So here, actin is, is bound to myosin, which is bound to ADP, which is bound to phosphate. Um, but when there's a plus that connects the two molecules, that means that they are separated. So ADP and phosphate in this uh, step number two are freed from the myosin head. So the myosin head, as you can see in the difference in positions here, undergoes this power stroke, moving the actin filament ever so slightly, um, this, of course, has taken place because calcium has bind to troponin. Uh, troponin is connected to tropomyosin, which moves tropomyosin out of the way, exposing the myosin binding heads on actin. Myosin binds to actin, undergoes its power stroke, loses ADP, and um, that uh, uh, phosphate as a result of that. And for the moment, actin is bound to myosin. Now, in order for actin to, to release from myosin, a new ATP, a fresh ATP molecule, has to come. It binds to myosin, and it allows myosin to, to release from actin. That energy is then used to re-cock, so to speak, this myosin head. So it moves it from this position back into this position, into the energized state. And once again, we are ready to go. So this is where we started. Myosin can now bind to actin and undergo another power stroke. And in fact, it will bind to actin and undergo another power stroke as long as trop uh, tropomyosin is still moved out of the way and the, the myosin binding site on actin is still available. You should expect myosin to bind to actin multiple times in a full muscle contraction. Don't think uh, 
of course you're not thinking this, but don't imagine that one power stroke is enough for a muscle to fully contract. It takes a number, 60 perhaps, of these power strokes in order for a muscle to fully contract. One other interesting thing to note here is the following, that ATP plays two roles. Oh, yeah, let's go back here. ATP plays two distinct roles in this process. One is obviously to energize myosin, and so you see that happening between step number four and step number five here. But the other role that ATP plays is that it enables myosin to release from actin. And so we see that occurring uh, between step two and step three. The fresh ATP molecule allows myosin to detach from actin. And so if ATP is not available, then something referred to as rigor mortis occurs. And so the stiffening of a dead body immediately following uh, death occurs as a result of the binding of myosin to actin and the inability of myosin to release from actin because no ATP is available. This is a nice animation that shows us all of these different steps. And so what we see is calcium binding to troponin, moving tropomyosin out of the way. That exposes the myosin binding sites on actin. And so myosin binds, undergoes a power stroke, releases, and then it's going to, uh, though it's not being sh shown in this animation, it's going to bind and undergo a second power stroke.